Oh, hi there. I didn't see you there. So welcome to the Backpacker Coach. Today I have another special episode of Chris Kramer's and the San Froon, the girls missing from Panama. So today I wanted to talk to you about the witnesses, but specifically I wanted to talk to you about how the witnesses were pretty much all that information was swept under the rug as soon as the backpack was found. So I wanted to uh, get into that today and I'm sure this nobody will find this. So let's get into this. So before we dig into the timeline before the backpack was created, I wanted to just go over a general showing you um, Boquette and its surrounding area just to get you kind of an idea of the area and where things are. And then we'll dig into the uh, the timeline of before the backpack. But before, first I want you to notice this here is, this little area right here is Boquette. And one of the things you'll notice is right over here is, remember the picture of the rock with two girls on the guy's phone that is dead now, that is this place. And that is 45 to 50 minutes away from Boquette. Now, people were always saying that this is near the Caldera Hot Springs. This is actually where um, Caldera Hot Springs is, which it's sort of near, but it is not real close. So that is the location of where that rock and the river are and the alleged picture of the of the San and Chris and this is where the actual caldera hot springs are all right so next let's go to kind of the area of the south part of Boquette this right here this is where the girls stayed at the, the house that they were staying for that short period of time. And then there is a bakery that apparently Lisanne liked to go to that was really close. And this place over here, I butcher the name, so I'm not gonna even try to say it, but this is where the girls were going to volunteer for the school to help with the teaching young kids Spanish and all that stuff. That's where that's where that building is. And then this direction over here is the Spanish by the river. And that is where they got quite a bit of help from these guys of figuring out things to do, where to go, and then before they right before they disappeared, where they, they helped they had the computer where they could um, make plans of what they were going to do for the rest of the week. They had Dutch speaking people there as well as I found out that some of the people that were working there also were at earlier before they were in Boquet at uh, Boca Centoro. Um, they were also there. Some of them were there like teaching a cooking class and doing some of the things there. So some of the people also were here, which is kind of interesting. So if you look here, there is a bus stop. It's really close by, just so you know that. That'll be important later. And then let's go down to the other part. So now let's go to the uh, northern part of Bouquet. And we'll see a few things here. Okay, so this is the restaurant Fusion that is where you see the pictures of the girls eating. I'll put that up on the screen. That is where, and that restaurant is now closed. There is another restaurant, that restaurant Nelivis, I guess, how you'd say that. That also is important, that we'll get to that later. And then there's also the grocery store. I'll post, put a picture up there of that. That's very important for later. And there over here is the Boquette Park. And that's where you see the pictures of them by the Flamingo and by other things. And I'll post, put a couple of those pictures up. So that's where that is. Okay. Now just a little further north. Up here.
we have the, the Casa Pedro. And then you have, then we have the top of the La Pedora de Line, is how I believe it's said. As well as over here, you have the um, trail of the La Pedera line, which runs up along the backside here. Although I'm not sure whether it goes to the top. So that's um, very important for later. And then up here, this is where the El Pianista restaurant is and also where the beginning of the El Pianista trail starts. Okay, so that is the general overview of Boquette. So we start at Spanish by the River at 10 o'clock, and that's because Chris and Lisanne had a computer check at 10 o'clock a.m., and it's believed that Lisanne's cell phone made a Wi-Fi connection at Spanish by the River at 10 10. So from there, if we're assuming that Lisanne was a great planner like she was, she would have already called a taxi to meet here at Spanish by the River, and they would have taken them down to the restaurant. Nelavis, and it also seems to indicate that Lisanne's cell phone connected to their Wi-Fi at 1026, which is feasible if um, Lisanne and Chris got a, a taxi like right after their check-in. It only takes eight minutes to go from uh, Spanish by the River to the restaurant for breakfast or brunch, whatever it was. Now also, something that is in uh, some of the different uh, blog posts is that when they were at the Delvis, that is um, alleged that they were talking to two strange men there. They don't really know who it was. They never were able to find out. And we're really not even sure whether they were actually at the, ne the Nelevis or not because there is no official, nothing official that says that they were for sure there. But that is what they think that the, uh, the Wi-Fi was connected there at, at Nel Venice or Val Valise, I don't know, whatever it is. And so let's say that they had breakfast there. So let's say from 10.30 to 11.30, and then they decided after that, that they would go to the grocery store to pick up a few things because they needed a few things for their, their hike and stuff for the day. So that's not very far away. That's only from here to there, which is only, it's a very short walk. So just a few blocks there. And the next interesting thing about um, them going to this grocery store is that the police did say that they did have a video footage of them in the store, but that it was accidentally deleted. And so we don't actually have an actual time of when they were there, but that would have helped out so much with having an actual time, an actual a visual of what they were wearing. That would have made all the difference in the world. But of course that is gone. So one more thing to chalk up to crazy things that happened on this case from there. So somewhere after, say, 11.45 or so, they would have been done here and they would have gone back up. Um, back up to Spanish by the River to make their final plans of where they were going to go for that day. So the last known time that the Spanish at the river people said that they were there was they left just after one o'clock. Okay, so we know by Ingrid, like I had said before, that the girls were at Spanish by the river 
at one o'clock and they just left just around 10 after 10 or just about 10 minutes after one o'clock the spanish by the river so that's pretty much honestly that is the last place known that the girls were that we know 100 percent sure that they were there from there it gets a little more fuzzy so we're going to go over of about three to four different scenarios of where the girls could have gone and we're going to go from there so the first one is the taxi driver and what he said where he went so the first is that they actually have witnesses that saw Kristen Lazan get into a taxi over here I believe and the taxi driver stated that he picked the girls up at around 1 30 which is interesting because apparently several um, people actually talked to Kristen Lasan before they got into a taxi then the next part is that the taxi driver said that he took the girls to the beginning of the El Pinista Trail and dropped them off at 145. Now, what is interesting about the timing of 145 is that there are literally almost no witnesses that see or allegedly see Chris and Lasan on the trail or near the trail before roughly three o'clock except for this over here but we'll get to this in a minute so that's also possible too so the first possibility is they saw a shop the food this shop thing that was nearby and wandered around that first but the uh, frank who is the shop owner said they looked like they already had been walking for a while and so that really wouldn't fit the description because they just stepped out of a taxi and they were going to so-called begin a hike. So that doesn't really match really that well. So we'll go over another uh, scenario in just a minute with this. Quite a few of the um, witnesses all claim to see Kristen Lasan along the trail starting somewhere between 3 and 3.30. Um, also, I wanted to mention uh, Lee Zeltazar. He was one of the first in Boquette to go um, up the Pianista Trail and talk to um, pretty much everybody along the, the Pianista Trail and gather evidence trying to figure out exactly what happened to Chris and Lazan. And he, in all of his findings that he had, all of his early reportings, that they were all, Chris and Lasan were seen around four o'clock and beyond the the beginning of the trail all around four so that is just something that i wanted to mention was this guy lee and his findings of of what he had found so that doesn't really work in the respect of them getting dropped off that still is an hour to hour and a half before they ever see the girls so it's kind of an odd window um could they be off by an hour i suppose but it doesn't quite work when you throw in the backpack and the pictures that doesn't make sense because now you have a time that the would have started with the photos they probably started 10 minutes after 11 which doesn't make any sense at all because the taxi driver stated that he dropped them off around 145 so that is the first scenario which obviously it doesn't match the witnesses and doesn't match the backpack so we're going to do another scenario and so the next scenario which will start the same and so once again they would have taken a um, taxi from from here and instead of going to the El Pianista trail it's possible that they ended up over here Dit neemt ons mee naar Casa Pedro, waarschijnlijk de laatste plaats waar Chris en Lisanne zijn gezien. Eén van de twee heeft hier gezeten, de andere heeft hier gestaan. En ze waren dus van plan om terug te gaan naar Boquette. En ze hebben hier een tijdje gezeten. De meneer hier van Casa de Pedro, die heeft ze gezien. En op een gegeven moment waren ze weg. Now, there is a hiking trail that actually, if you go past these houses and go up through here, then the trail runs up the top of here and it's very steep and 
and apparently some people actually say that somebody charges actually money to go over their property sometimes, but I don't know whether that was the case back then. Okay, so they were dropped off by the taxi driver, and then I wanted to show you kind of some interesting things about the surrounding area of what's around the, the Casa Pedro. And what's interesting about this is that um, first, that little place, um, it's a youth hostel and also possibly a church. But um, if you look right across the street from the Casa Pedro, um, you can see a sign. And the sign, which I'll, sh I'll throw up there, is shows that the one hiking trail, I'll just call it the Lino um, de Lino, says it goes to the left and the El Pianista Trail has a straight arrow and it's going this way that you have to walk about 20 minutes down to that trail. So that's kind of interesting. It's possible that they could have been dropped off here. And then the interesting thing, there are two witnesses that one was, his name was Pedro or sometimes he's also known as Peter. And he says that he talked to the girls and they asked whether or not this was the El Pianista Trail. And he said that, no, this is not the Pianista Trail, but this um, trail over here is a nice trail. Um, you can see the um, olive bouquet from the top of this um, hike and it's very pretty, that kind of stuff. And so he said that they started on this hike and then just like 15 minutes later, they come back. And he asked, did you get to the top? And they said, yes. And he said that he knows that they were lying because um, it takes at least 45 minutes to get to the top of that hike. Also, I have a video of another guy who did the whole entire hike. I'll post the link below um, of somebody who did the whole hike. So what's interesting is that then there was another guy. See his name, Jose. It looks like. And then Jose um, also spoke with the girls, said in the late afternoon. And what's, what's interesting is that he saw them sit down, you know, by that the Casa Pedro. And they sat there for, he says, a very long time. And so we're going to go over kind of like what that exactly means. But oh, the other thing I wanted to tell you is that he, they came back and they said they were very tired and they didn't want to do any more hiking. And they just wanted to go back to Boquet, which is kind of interesting. And then he explained to them how to get a taxi and where to get a taxi. And then he saw them just sit there for, he says, a long time, which is kind of hard to know what that exactly means. But I think we could figure that out by some of the other stuff here that we're going to go over. So if they they arrived there same time as what we think around two o'clock. And so then you have them talking for say a couple minutes and then they walk up the trail and walk back in about 15 minutes. So somewhere between 15 minutes to a half an hour. I don't know if it's they walk up 15 minutes and then walk back 15 minutes or whether it was just in 15 minutes. It's kind of unclear. But anyway, it says in 15 minutes they came back so then that would put the time maybe around 2:20 2:30 is when the other the other man saw Jose saw them and talked to them and now what's interesting is that they can't be at two places at the same time they couldn't be at the Alpinista trail at two o'clock and they can't be here at two o'clock so they have to be at one of these places so here's what i think happened next well he said that they waited for a long time i'm going to guess that they were um, waited for roughly about a half an hour and they were waiting for for a bus or for a taxi and for I'm guessing for about a half an hour or that they didn't it didn't show up but then by the time that they decided they sat there for a half an hour that maybe they felt okay they're like well maybe we'll just go walk over to the pianista trail that which I'll show you it only takes 20 minutes to walk from the from here from the the Casa Pedro over here to the El Pianista Trail. So if it only takes about 20 minutes, that would put them there roughly a little bit before 
3 o'clock or close to 3 o'clock and that is close to the exact same time that Frank here saw the girls and the, so they've been walking for a fair bit. Otro testigo que las ve estaba en la tienda Nelita. Eran las tres y media y cuenta que una de las chicas se veía enferma. Me encontraba aquí en, en esta tiendita atendiendo a los clientes, pero en el momento yo estaba, eran como las una, dos y media, tres de la tarde cuando las muchachas bajaron, sí. Pero una sí bajó, la más gordita que iba en una licra negra y la otra la alcancé a ver, pero cuando iba allá abajo, porque la otra iba por este lado. Pero no pudo, se fue por allá porque como la piedra era suelta, la muchacha se fue de largo y allá en la vuelta fue que se logró ver nada más. Sí, lo que sí que la que iba aquí iba bien agobiada, bien estropeada, parece de caminar mucho. Y sí, contenta sí, pero de ahí no le puedo decir si las muchachas bajaron hasta el pueblo, se devolvieron en un taxi, si bajaron en taxi, no sé, pero yo hasta la vuelta la alcancé a ver. Which would make sense because they just took a 20 minute walk plus their other hike that they did. And he said he saw them between 2.30 and 3, which would be very close because as we just stated, as I just stated before, it would be very close to 3 o'clock when they would have made it up here. So next is the fact there are more witnesses. The first witness that is talked about is the there is a restaurant employee that said that she talked to the girls between 3 and 3 30 which works very good with that scenario that we just talked about now one interesting thing um, to mention the owner of the el pianista also saw the girls hitchhiking which i don't think that they were hitchhiking or it would not be those not be Chris in the sand because I don't believe that they would be hitchhiking. I think they would know better, but maybe he just mistook them for hitchhiking just because they were walking along the side of the road. But he said that he also saw them walking along the side of the road somewhere between 2.30 and 3 as well. The next interesting thing is if you start down the Pinista Trail, it only takes a few minutes to get down to the first witness on the trail, and that was Olivia. And Olivia is that this house right here that is, I'll show you, I'll put that up. That's that bluish greenish house that you first walk by. And she says that she saw them around four o'clock. Para quien no pasaron desapercibidas, fue para la señora Oliva. Esta testigo percibe el peligro del bosque para estas chicas. Ahí yo las vi cruzando, eh, como a las cuatro y algo de la tarde. Si yo hubiese sabido que ellas me iban a entender, yo hubiera bajado y le digo que no, voy, no subieran porque era demasiado tarde para ellas. El día estaba opaco y se iba a oscurecer temprano. Así que, pero ellas no me iban a entender porque yo no sé hablar inglés y ellas no sabían hablar inglés. Es que cuando las vio usted, ¿en qué pensó? Que era demasiado tarde y que eran dos niñas que iban solitas para la montaña y que iba a oscurecer más rápido que en otras ocasiones porque el día estaba feo. Así que ese fue mi, mi pensamiento y se lo hice saber a mi esposo que estaba ahí conmigo. Pero al día siguiente nos enteramos pues que, que se habían extraviado. ¿Algo más que usted viera y que le llamara la atención? Me, me llamó la atención que llevaban un pantaloncito corto, que iban para la montaña, que hacía frío y que la maleza le iba a lastimar las piernas y el frío les iba a molestar. And then if you go just across that little tiny, the, the river that has the, the small footbridge that's just made out of bamboo, and then you go through the everybody's backyard, then there's the other witness, and also play the video of that as well. Por allí pasaron Chris y Lisan, quienes además descubrieron un frágil puente artesanal, hecho de bambú, madera y alambres, por el que tuvieron que cruzar. En ese camino, Martina de la etnia Nove arreglaba sus plantas cuando la saludaron. Yo trabajo en esto semando plantas y yo estaba aquí cuando la chica pasó. ¿Cómo sabes que era la luz? Bueno, porque bueno, ellos era, andaban dos muchachas juntas, se fue. Entonces cuando, entre tres días, 
viene el, el guía que es Feliciano González, viene, me pregunta y me trae el foto, ahí donde que me di cuenta que era ella lo que había yo visto. ¿Y, ¿Y qué te acuerdas de ella? ¿Qué fue lo que viste de ella? Bueno, como yo estaba aquí, yo no, no, o sea, no reparo la persona, bueno, solamente veo la cara porque ella pasó y me dijo, no es eso. Sí, sí. Y, y entonces no reparé más, con más, o sea, no reparo porque este es un sendero de los turismo y... ¿Iván Sole? Solo, sí. Uh -huh. ¿Viste entrar algún carro o algo? Bueno, eso sí, no. But then there's the other witness that also saw, allegedly saw Chris and Lasanne somewhere around four o'clock. So now there are some more witnesses also that um, also allegedly saw the girls. Okay, so the next witness was Lorenzo, and I'll tape, I'll play that video first for you. Lorenzo es guía de turismo y conoce todos los senderos de Boquete. Fue el último testigo que las vio. Bueno, yo vi dos mujeres, dos personajes, así como dos mujeres, pues. Pero yo estaba muy lejos de donde estaba. ¿Y cuando usted las vio, ellas hacia dónde iban? Bueno, llevan casi de espalda, para hacia allá, para hacia arriba. Ok, y él dijo que vio que estaban sentados en el old shed, um, resting. Ahora, una cosa interesante que note. notar. If you see somebody sitting there resting, you don't know which direction. I know that he said that they were ascending the trail, but if they're sitting there, you don't know which direction they're going. They could be going up, they could be going down. So how he knows that they're going up if they're sitting there is beyond me, because if they were sitting there, how would you know? But anyway, um, he says that he saw them at four o'clock by the old shed. So. If um, Lorenzo apparently lives somewhere in this area of by that old shed. And so now if so if you take the four o'clock and you go backwards to the beginning of the trail, you end up at roughly uh, 3.30, which is also when the the people at the beginning of the trail at the El Pianista saw the girls. So that also kind of works out for timing. And you can do it the other way around. If you want to say that Lorenzo was off by half an hour and it still works out. If you go, you say that uh, instead Lorenzo saw the girls at 4.30, that would just put um, them starting the trail at around four, which is also what Olivia had said. So it still works out all in, generally all in that same time. And then that would mean that the employee at the El Pianista was only, you know, about a half an hour off. That is not bad at all. So it's still very feasible that they would have started around four. Now, there is one more witness who said that they could see them uh, very far off in the distance from his house. And that's just 10 minutes past the old shed. So 10 minutes past there, and that's the last place they were allegedly seen. Now, you could easily question that he could have seen anybody because if you, if I show you the house of how far away it is from the trail, that's a very long distance from where you would actually be able to see. You can barely, you can barely make out anything. Um, so I'd, I don't know how legitimate that would be just because you could barely tell that, you know, they were there, whoever was walking along the trail, it could have been anybody, but that's in the in our case file that is what we're going to go with for now so if you realize that if they were only really only into the trail by a half an hour at 4:10, say imagine that they still had quite a ways to go to get to the top of the alpinista trail i mean that's only like i said before if they were only half an hour in and it was 4:10. And it takes roughly two hours at least to, to get up to the top of the El Pianista Trail. So you still would have to get saying that they started at, let's just say they started at 3.30. That's 3.30, 4.30, 5.30. So they would have, you know, roughly made it to the top of the El Pianista if they made it that far um, at 5.30. And so then now you're saying, well, now they have to get down. So say it takes about an hour and a half to get down that would have put them close to seven o'clock which is almost a half an hour past 
sunset. Now, a little interesting thing to note is that the sunset, I believe, was around 6.30. So they could have made it back up and down in that time. Um, would have been obviously getting a little dark, but it's feasible that they could have done gone up to the top and back. So it is possible. Now, of course, if you go by the other pictures, you know, they went past the top of the El Pinista Trail for about a half an hour. And so that's even pushing it even more. So we established that they would have gotten to the top at 530. So then they would have gone down all the way to the last known picture, which was 508. And that would have put them down there somewhere around six o'clock. And then let's say if they wanted to go back up, then that would have taken probably roughly about an hour. Then they would have gotten back to the top by seven o'clock. And then to get back all the way to the beginning of the trail, they would have gotten back to the beginning of the Pianista somewhere between 8.30 to nine o'clock. It's really kind of hard to believe that girls would have been out there that late been walking around in an unfamiliar place nearly at sunset or and it would be pretty dark I would assume in most of the jungle because if you're under the jungle canopy it would be pretty dark you know because sun would be setting it would it would be dark so I mean obviously not pitch black but I mean when the sun is low and you're in the shade you know you could tell it would be be relatively dark so that would be kind of crazy that I would think that girls would even be out there that late. So just for the fun of it, we're going to say that, that they made it to, to hiking about to about four, four ten, and decided that they were tired and they didn't want to go any further into the, the trail. And we're going to say that they came down and they met someone and maybe a red truck. And we're going to say that, that they were probably tired of walking. They might have met somebody that they recognized. And I'd obviously don't think that they would have gone with somebody, you know, in a red truck. You know, they wouldn't know because anyway, just just for the sake of the other um, the pool picture with the girls, we're going to do that just for the fun of it. So say that they or they came back down somewhere or you know, a little bit after four o'clock. They met uh, someone that they may have recognized and then they would have driven back to the swimming spot. And let's look at the map here, see how long it takes. It would take roughly about 54 minutes to go from the El Pinista up that area all the way over to the swimming spot. Now what's interesting to note, if you look at the swimming spot, you can tell that if you look at the picture that it was either taken in the early morning or taken in the very late afternoon because it's mostly covered in shade but you can see at the very top there you can see that there's a little bit of sun so it's obviously either at the end of the day or it's at the beginning of the day most likely i would imagine at the end of the day i don't know how many people obviously would swim in the morning I'm sure some people do, but most people I imagine would probably swim at the end of the day. So we're going to assume it's the end of the day. So let's just say they got picked up somewhere around 4.30. And so that would put them around over here, let's say at roughly close to 5.30, which is close to within an hour of the sunset time. So that would match at least the, the photo, which is kind of interesting. Do I actually believe that happened? Not necessarily, but I thought we could at least play out that scenario just for the fun of it anyway. Now, there is one more possibility, and there's a few things that I left out specifically just to uh, not confuse the matter because there are a lot of uh, confusing things uh, about this case. And so if you wanna read like the whole, be totally really well confused, uh, do suggest that you go and read the whole blog that uh, Scarlett, but her blog is very detailed and that's where I got most of my information from. So Scarlett has a lot of information and it will can go over all the different things. I kind of simplified it a little bit here just to make it a little more, you know, not quite so mind-numbing. But uh, 
Anyway, we're going to go over another scenario that also might be possible. So the other possibility is that it was just a case of mistaken identity and that they, everybody that thought they saw a crystal in the sand, that was not them, somebody else, which is possible. Um, we've talked to other people in other cases that like a hundred, uh, you know, a hundred percent of all the witnesses were wrong. So it is possible. Um, and that is only possible because of a couple things that we're going to go over. If we didn't have these other things, then I'd say it's maybe not possible, but there are a couple things. So the first interesting thing was that our our friend uh, Ingrid also mentions that somewhere a little bit after one o'clock that they were caught on camera walking toward the to the grocery store. So that's very interesting that they were caught that they saw the cameras in the area caught them walking toward that. Now have we ever seen any footage of that? Of course not because nobody's ever released that. So. Do we know if that's true? Not necessarily, but we're going to take it as that that was something that was real. That there's no reason why she would lie. So if we say that they were down here at one o'clock, the next interesting thing is that around two o'clock, Chris talks to her boyfriend through one of her applications and says that um, they're going to go for a walk. She talked to her boyfriend at two o'clock. Now, here's a couple interesting things about this. One, the girls normally always kept their phones on airplane mode unless they were at a restaurant or whatever, and then they would take their, their phone off of airplane mode and then connect to Wi-Fi. Hence the reason why we believe that they connected to the Melavis and to the Spanish by the river and that kind of thing. But we don't know where they connected at two o'clock. It could have been, you know, anywhere here. It's also possible. Some people say that they could have um, connected at the El Pianista trail at two o'clock. We don't really know where at two o'clock they were at. We have no idea. But here's the thing. If they were talking, if Chris was talking to her boyfriend at two o'clock, that would definitely mean there's no way that they could be up on the trail or coming back to the trail or be way back into the El Pianista trail and talking to, you know, her boyfriend because they were still somewhere, you know, probably in Boquette somewhere and still safe at two o'clock because they they were, you know, they were still safe. So I'm going to play the video of, of Chris's parents saying that, and then we'll go on from there. Volgens mij, en ik weet dat Stefan, de vriend van Chris, eh, dinsdagmiddag nog contact heeft gehad. Twee in Nederlandse tijd ongeveer. En eh, ja, dat is het laatste bericht. Twee in plaatselijke tijd. Oh, twee in plaatselijke tijd. Oké, okay. ja, nou, nou maar in ieder geval. Ja. En, en uh, hoe, hoe ging het toen met haar? Ja, goed. Ze hadden het erg, uh, erg naar hun zin. En uh, ja, ze waren heel vrolijk en heel enthousiast over uh, wat ze allemaal meemaakten en wat ze allemaal zagen. En uh, ze hadden er erg veel zin in. Want ik had, ik zei ook van, ze hadden allemaal plannen ook nog hè, voor de rest. Oké, okay. so now the next interesting thing that I was talking about has to do with the their cell phones. Now, as you've seen before, everybody always talks about their cell phones and how, you know, they had a certain percentage of signal strength. And then at some point they lost signal strength. And then the course, which everybody says, you know, it works out to that. They, you know, just lost the signal strength near the top and whatever all. Well, here's the problem with the whole signal strength is that they kept their phones most of the time on airplane mode. So they wouldn't have had their phones, you know, just in a normal mode, walking along the El Pianista trail, because that is what they normally did, is that they normally kept their phones on airplane mode. And so if they kept their, their phone normally on airplane mode, they wouldn't have had any signal. So it's very feasible that they were walking, you know, around Boquette and somebody saw them and somehow they got yanked into a van and they grabbed their phones and they they took their phones, their phones went one way, the girls went another way and they 
somehow were able to, you know, fake all that, which is possible. I think that is a feasible thing that they could, you know, force them to, you know, show them their passwords. And that also that would kind of explain why the, you know, somebody tried to, you know, get into, it was Chris's phone, you know, so many times because somebody probably forgot the password and that kind of stuff. So that is, I believe the, the fourth scenario is that, you know, they never made it to the Alpinista trail at all. Also, some of the other evidence that would support that they never made it to the trail at all is the XF data of all of the images as well as the images themselves. The first part, the XF data is a disaster. There's so many things wrong with the XF data as well as the images themselves. Obviously, you can look and tell that there's something just not right. There's that there are just things that are not right that you would think that uh, they would have taken more pictures. There would be more pictures of, of the trail, of the girls. Just something is not quite right. And so between those, also those two things, that, that would also would lend itself to the theory of or never made it to the Alpinista Trail at all. That is kind of why it goes back to what I had said before about why the theory goes of why they planted the backpack in the first place. Because once you plant that backpack, backpack there's some amount of closure and then it just all of a sudden all goes away and so you're I know everybody's always asking why didn't they just not have anything and make everything all disappear well they did and that didn't work that's that's part of the issue is that they didn't have anything they did just disappear they didn't have anything at all you know there was no trace of them but i believe that because of the fact that chris's parents were so persistent and the the authorities that they that they hired were just like you know little annoying chihuahuas always barking and trying to get more information that they had to decide this is just not working. They're not going away. They're not taking the information and just walking away with it. So they had to come up with some way to kind of calm all that down. And the best way to do that was to plant a backpack and to plant the pictures on the camera that would show something that at least it would look like they just went up there and got lost. Then all they have to do is just plant a few very small pieces of bone and say that they found them being that there's only a few small pieces you can't really get any information um, from those few pieces so you're just giving just enough information but not enough to actually get a good idea of actually what happened so i wanted to show you how the emergency calls would work into this timeline so first like i had said before if the girls would have started out at 3.30 here at the beginning of the Pianista Trail and it would have taken them 45 minutes to get up to the small stream crossing by 4.15. Then just five minutes later by 4.20 they would have made it to the, the last place that they were seen. So now what's interesting is just 19 minutes later they would have made their first emergency call. And then 12 minutes later would have been the other emergency call, which is a whole nother issue by itself. We're not gonna get into that right now. Going back to the first emergency call, that means from here, they were only 20 minutes into another hour hike to get to the top of the El Pianista Trail. So they wouldn't have made it to the top until roughly 5.15, somewhere between 5.15 and 5.30. They had a long ways to go. They would have somewhere, only been in here somewhere, which is very interesting. If you go by the uh, the witness timeline and then go by the phone calls that were made. Which brings us to our other final scenario. This scenario is very popular with the Panamanian people. And what we found out is that they believe that Chris and Lisanne were taken by a group of indigenous Panamanian people. There are many indigenous tribes in Panama, and each with its own laws and traditions. But there are some smaller tribes that are cut off and have always been hidden. They have no contact with other nearby tribes because they do not approve of the tribe practicing cannibalism as a means of survival. The government in Panama has no jurisdiction 
over these indigenous tribes. They rule themselves. They have their own government and internal laws. So the government doesn't interfere with the indigenous tribes. So what's interesting is that they told Chris and Lisan to not, you know, go alone. But what's interesting is they were told to not go alone, not because they would get lost, but the guide really isn't a guide, but more of a safe passage through the jungle. That as long as a guide is with them, that the indigenous people will not mess with them. But if there's no guide, they're free to be able to take, and there's no problem with that in their mind. And so that is one of the things that Panamanians, um, quite a few Panamanians believe, which is a very interesting scenario. And it's also, it's, you know, it's feasible. And of course, this scenario has its own problems. Uh, not as much with Chris and the sand being taken, but more having to deal with the backpack and how was it transferred to someone who could be able to deal with manipulating all that information. That's definitely a very large hole in this scenario. So anyway, that is just something to think about. So one of the other things I wanted to talk about that I couldn't really fit into the um, first part of the scenarios was the uh, attorney that Chris and Lisanne's family had. And it's very interesting that they seem to be alluding that his attorney was being threatened. The day before, when we arranged this meeting over the phone, he'd hinted that his life has been threatened over the Kramer's Froon case. Perhaps for that reason, he's accompanied to our table by a bouncer-sized bodyguard. Which, if, you know, the girls had been lost and fell off just the monkey bridge and and there was no foul play involved nothing really bad had happened why would you know an attorney be threatened that's kind of suspicious right there as well as there's a couple other interesting things that this attorney said and i'll play the video for you i just think it's kind of interesting about what he said if my client and miss froon had died of natural causes Arocha says in a rapid whisper, so as not to be overheard by nearby tables, grease from decomposition would impregnate the clothes and backpack. The bodyguard and I both lean in with interest, and Arocha continues in the same hushed tone. It's almost impossible for the bones to be in this condition, he says, and points out that the lead forensic examiner had publicly speculated that lime might have been used to hasten decomposition. The evidence seems to have been manipulated in order to hide something, says Arocha, who at one point threatened to take the case to the International Court of Justice, ICJ. At the very least, there should have been a criminal investigation, he slaps his hand on the table. Even the Panamanian forensic examiners wanted to do that, but the prosecutor threw out all our petitions. Some high-profile members of the Panamanian press also were skeptical about the official theory. All right, so just wanted to show you guys that video and just wanted to put that out there. And that was from the uh, Daily Beast, I believe. So anyway, then there's just one more thing I wanted to go over. Okay, the then the last part I just want to go over is there are a few other sightings that are kind of interesting in the respect of where uh, where they could have gone possibly and so we don't really have times on these or don't have a lot of information but there's these two other uh, spots here where they were allegedly cited and clothing description way down here so you're probably wondering how far away is that from everything else and so I'll show you the map. If you look at this map, you can see from the El Pinista Trail down to the, la the uh, this other spot that they were, this is the, a restaurant called The Rock. And it would only take 25 minutes to walk down to The Rock. There's a couple restaurants actually. There's another restaurant um, in here. There's, there's the cafe that's also right here. And so there were, there's a few restaurants and a, and a few interesting things along here, which would beg the other, you know, question of, you know, did they walk down here? Which is another possibility if they have a clothing description match, like I showed you before, way down here, 
which is 25 minutes walk from the El Pinista Trail. And so that's a, another interesting thing. I don't know how that fits in. You know, it's hard to know. We don't have any timing of, of when they were spotted. So it's hard to know <clears throat> how to fit that in. But I just thought it would be interesting to mention that there's they were also apparently spotted in that area. And that's just one other thing I thought I'd mention is that of all the places that, you know, they could have been seen, it's very interesting that the they were actually spotted in a small area that, you know, they didn't pop up, you know, over here and over here and over here and over here. And, you know, they didn't pop up all over the place in, in random places. They were, you know, spotted in a very small area, which to me, you know, that would suggest that people were actually correct that, you know, they, like I said, if they're all over the place, then you'd, then it'd be very confusing to like, you know, see where they were at, but it's not really not that sporadic. It's actually, they were, or possibly seen at least in a small area. It, it's not, uh, not all over the place, which is kind of interesting. And that was another thing to mention is that most of all of the the witnesses, even if you don't want to go say the witnesses were correct, but all of them were very confident that that they all went up, you know, around three thirty, four o'clock. And and as soon as the backpack was, you know, found and they showed the pictures, pretty much all the all the different witnesses was all just swept right under the rug. And so so you might be thinking, well, all those theories are a bunch of hogwash. And I only want to believe only the pictures and I'm going to go by that. So let me remind you of something that if you go by the pictures, there are no witnesses of any taxi drivers that have come forward of getting them to the trail by a little bit before 1130. And there are no witnesses of Chris and the San on the trail at 1130 and beyond. So that's just something to consider. Thanks for watching and we'll, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe and don't forget to check my next video.